Thanks for all those kind, encouraging words you said about me. If you want to know who I really am, have a word with my wife. <laughs> and I often say when I hear someone talk like that about me, I say, you know, I can't wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> well, it's, it's just such a pleasure to be back here this morning with you folk. And uh, I, I love coming here. I just look forward to my times here so much. Rudolph and I have built up such a good relationship. And believe me, I could say a lot of things about him. They're very similar to things he said about me. He's, he's one of the top apologist uh, ministers in this country. And I'm very grateful for his learning, his knowledge, everything about him. He's just a tremendous encouragement and inspiration to me. Now, this morning, I'm going to do something different. I think uh, Rudolph centered it at you. Um, I'm involved, like Rudolph, in a tremendous amount of study on Christian apologetics. And that doesn't mean we're apologizing for that, our faith. It means we're defending it. And I find that with the attacks that are coming on Christianity, there's more and more of a need for us to know why we believe what we do so much as knowing what we believe. And not only the inspiration to live good Christian lives and be good servants of God, but the education to know why what we believe is true. And this morning I'm going to take a subject that is one of the most easily attacked subjects in the Christian scriptures as far as unbelieving scholars are concerned, and that is the virgin birth of Jesus. If you're prepared to sit here for an hour and a half, I'll go through five different ways in which the attack on the virgin birth is uh, at, uh, done by our people outside there. But I don't want to keep you here for an hour and a half, so I'm going to just cover one of them and we'll be gone within about an hour and a quarter. So, <laughs> now I'm going to just talk this morning on the major attack, and that's the attack on the scripture itself. Uh, the other ones, like for example, people say, oh, doesn't this have parallels to virgin birth with births of pagan gods that became human beings? Uh, the Muslims say, wasn't Jesus born of a virgin just as a sign of God's power? Uh, there's so many different ways. Uh, scientists say virgin birth couldn't happen, it's not scientifically possible, and so on. Now, we're not going to go into those. What I'm going to go into this morning is the two narratives of the virgin birth in the New Testament. Because if I was ever asked to debate this subject, I would have to say, what assurance have we got that our belief in the virgin birth of Jesus is true? The only answer is the credibility of the account of the virgin birth in Matthew and Luke. That's all. The reason is because there's no other portion of scripture that ever mentions it. You might be surprised to know that the other gospels, John and Mark, do not mention the virgin birth of Jesus at all. Paul never mentions it. Revelation doesn't mention it. Uh, the virgin birth is crucial to understanding who Jesus is. Because he is the son of God and pre-existed, that's why he was born of a woman only. But all we've got is Matthew and Luke's accounts. And one of the biggest problems here is that critical scholars say these two accounts are so contradictory, so different to each other, that you can't trust them. Now, I'm going to read to you from two books on the virgin birth. These are the two most famous comprehensive books written. This is J. Gresham Mashon's book, The Virgin Birth of Christ. Now, this is a Christian book, a classic defense of the supernatural birth of our Lord. But I want to read to you what he says about Luke and Matthew's narratives. The question arises whether any literary relationship can be established between them. In other words, are they connected? Are they telling the same story? And Mashon himself says that question must be clearly answered in the negative. In other words, the two accounts have got no connection with each other other than the fact of the virgin birth. He says, it is evident in the first place that neither narrative is dependent on the other. In other words, neither one is linked to the other one. Luke didn't look at Matthew first or the other way around and write to his account. He said those difficulties are not sufficient to establish contradiction between them, but they do suffice to show independence. There can be no reasonable doubt but that the author of the infancy narrative in Matthew was writing in complete independence of the infancy narrative in Luke and vice versa. Equally unlikely is the view that the two narratives were derived from a common source. Well, if that's the case, and that's a Christian writer, believing Christian apologist, writing and saying 
that these two are so totally independent, they've got no link, no common source. Well, that scares me because that means we looks like the virgin birth may be mythological. This is how mythologies are created. Truth comes from one single truth source. Truth, I've always said if there's 50 apples in a box, there's only one way of describing the truth about the apples in the box, and that's to say there's 50. There's at least 49 other ways of, of getting it wrong, <laughs> but there's only one of getting it right. And it's the same with the story. It must have a single origin to be factual, historical, and true. And J. Gresham Masham says there isn't one. Matthew and Luke are totally independent of each other, which makes it sound like somebody invented the story of the virgin birth and Matthew and Luke just followed embellishments of it. And let me tell you, just to make things sound worse, that if you look at the early Christian apocryphal literature, the virgin birth of Jesus is embellished heavily with stories that are not in the scriptures. And although they've only got a small place in the four gospels, virgin birth dominates the infancy narratives, the Latin gospel of the infancy, the Arabic gospel of the infancy, the infancy gospel of Thomas, the pseudo gospel of James, the, sorry, of Matthew, the proto gospel of James. These are all apocryphal works that are not genuine. They were written about 150 to 200 years later then they are embellishing the virgin birth story. So, of course, the argument of critical scholars is, sounds like the original story is mythological. Well, now let me take you to the second book. There's a third one I've just read, but I didn't bring this morning. It's a small one by a guy called Box, and he makes the same statement. Now, look at the size of this book. Now, look, folk, believe me, I've actually read this book <laughs> from cover to cover. Uh, it's written by a guy called pa uh, Raymond Brown. Now, Raymond Brown, very famous Catholic scholar. He passed away about 20, 25 years ago. But he wrote a phenomenal gospel commentary on the Gospel of John, for which he's most famous. But this book, The Birth of the Messiah, is regarded as the definitive book on the virgin birth. And unfortunately, he takes more of a historian's approach. He's even more negative than Maschin. But on the other hand, he's a Roman Catholic, so he has to believe in the virgin birth. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't last long in the Catholic Church. So he mixes himself up a bit, but he's as definitive as the other writers when he says, no way that these two had any connection. And he says, let's make a detailed comparison of the two narratives to see whether they confirm or contradict each other. And then he gives a whole lot of contradictions. And he says, the Lucan account only covers this and so on. And he says, if there was one narrative originally, how did it ever become fragmented into the two different accounts we have now? Which is virtually what I said to you. If there was one original story, how come the two, two narratives are so different? And then lastly, one is hard-pressed to find elsewhere in the Gospels the theology so imaginatively presented. It's just hinting all along that these stories may be mythical. Um, from a Christian point of view, from my point of view, I've looked very hard at Luke, I've looked at Matthew, and I've come to the conclusion, and that's what I'm going to speak to you about today, I'm going to tell you things you haven't heard before. But if you think I'm wrong, you're welcome to challenge me afterwards. But I believe that the evidence for Luke's dependence on Matthew is overwhelming. But people just don't see it. Certainly critical scholars have never seen it. They concentrate on the differences. If you look at Luke, Luke has a genealogy of Jesus that is different to Matthew's. Matthew's goes with three sections, from Abraham down to David, down to the deportation to Babylon. And he calls it 14 generations, three. Very well done in a Jewish context. Abraham, the patriarch, and the patriarchs that followed. David, the king, and the kings that followed. And then after the deportation to Babylon, names we don't know. Luke, however, goes the other way. He's got names we don't know from David, and he makes Jesus' birth line go through Nathan, a son of David who's only mentioned late in the Old Testament. And Luke carries it right back to Adam, and the genealogies from there on are totally different. Not only that, as scholars point out, Matthew says that, when, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and then two years later, Herod sent his army or his soldiers to kill all the babes in Bethlehem because they knew the Messiah had been born there according to what he was hearing. Then Joseph and Mary disappeared to uh, Egypt for anything up to four years. Then, then Herod dies, so they come back 
And then when they find that Archelaus is ruling over Judea, this is now six years later, uh, they decide to go and live in Naz Nazareth to get away from Judea. Luke's account, they say totally contradictory. Luke says, no, 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 Jesus came from, uh, and parents came from Nazareth in the first place. They were always living there. They came down to Bethlehem because of a census that they had to go there. And then when Jesus was born, they went to Jerusalem and did the offerings for him on the eighth day, according to the law, and then they returned to Nazareth. And they said, look, you know, you can't reconcile these accounts. Well, those two are easily reconciled. Luke knows Matthew. I'm going to show you that. He knows Matthew very well. So that begs a question, why does he not repeat the story? Because he knows Matthew records all those incidents because Matthew says, this fulfilled the scripture. Uh, but you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, from you will come a ruler who will govern my people. Luke knows that Matthew is quoting scripture for the Jewish people to whom his gospel is directed to prove the prophetic heritage. Luke doesn't contradict Matthew. All he says is that when everything was said and done, they went to Nazareth, and the two coincide. But watch what I want to show you. I want to show you that there's a distinct difference between Luke and Matthew in their understanding of the birth of Jesus and of their purpose. And this is what scholars miss. They miss the whole difference of understanding it. If you look at Matthew, and I'm going to be Luke, Luke reads Matthew's genealogy, and he sees Abraham, David, prophets, kings, everybody. And Luke says, very well done. Matthew, I know what you're doing. You want to prove that Jesus was the weighted Messiah of Israel. And one thing Luke's very impressed with, with Matthew, is that Matthew realizes that although the Messiah was interchangeably called the son of David, Matthew starts with Abraham not David, says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he starts from Abraham down, and Luke says, that's brilliant. He says, because that's exactly who Jesus was. He came into the world as the son of Abraham, came to fulfill the promises God made to Abraham. He'll come back second time, fulfill the promises made to David. But then Luke looks at him and he says, but what you've done, Matthew, is show a genealogy, a vertical genealogy down through Abraham the patriarch to whom a son was promised, David the king to whom a son was promised, first and second sons and so on. He says, and watch this, in Luke 3 verse 1, he says, uh, in the days of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, of Judea, sorry, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Ituria, Trachonitis, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. Now, <laughs> you read that and you say, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Let me tell you, it's got intense meaning. What Luke is saying, I'm putting the virgin birth of Jesus into a different context. Matthew has looked at the vertical. I'm going for the horizontal. Matthew has gone through the heritage of the Jewish Messiah. I'm going through the present extent of the whole world. You've gone through the whole of history. I'm going through the whole of geography. The Roman uh, uh, Caesar, Tiberius, rules Rome. Um, Pontius Pilate rules Judea. Uh, Tetrarch and others are, uh, sorry, <laughs> Herod and others are Tetrarchs of regions. And Annas and Caiaphas are the high priests. So Luke says, in the age of all these bigwigs, uh, John the Baptist goes into the wilderness and the word of God comes to him. But what he's pointing out is that he's going to show that Jesus has come for the whole world because he's a Gentile himself. So he says, Matthew, what you've done, you've shown the vertical line. I'm going to go for the horizontal. You've gone for history. I'm going for geography. What's Luke doing? Do you know what he's doing? And he does it all the time, as you're going to see. He's, I've only got one English word for it, and most of you probably haven't heard it. In fact, there isn't even a, a verbal form of it in the dictionary, but I've invented one. The word is called kaleidoscope. Who knows what a kaleidoscope is? <laughs> All right, well, I'll show you what a kaleidoscope is. That is a kaleidoscope. Why? If you put these together, they one. But you split them, and they two. And what are the two? They're the same, but they're different. 
You know, when we go to Thailand, my wife and I, because my son lives there, there's a lovely English expression in Thailand. You go to a cafe or a restaurant and you look at it and you say, I want this Thai food with chicken. Okay, fine. No, no, fine. So they come back and they bring you Thai food with beef. And you say, no, but I ordered the chicken. No, no, no more chicken. Yes, but I ordered with chicken. You're giving me beef. No, 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 it's the same. You say, no, it's not the same. That's chicken and beef. They're not the same. No, no, it's the same meal. Same meal as meat. Same, same, just different. <laughs> now, that's what a kaleidoscope is. That's just what it is. Same, same, just different. In this hand, the finger's on the left. Here, it's on the right, the little one. In this hand, the thumb's here, the thumb's there. The kaleidoscope means they're totally different, but they're actually put together they're the same. And this is what Luke does. He, now here comes my verb, it's not in the dictionary. He kaleidoscopes Matthew. That's what he's doing. And you know why he does it? Because he knows, Luke knows, Jesus came into the world not only as the promised Messiah of Israel, he also came as the Savior of the whole world. And he says, that's what I know. And that's why he covers it further. And that's why Luke goes for the son of Abraham, because the promise that God made to Abraham was simply this. I will give you a son. Through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. To David, God said, I will give you a son, and I will establish his throne forever. Two different sons, but the same Messiah. Comes the first time as the son of Abraham, whom Isaac foreshadowed. Isaac was born uniquely. Isaac was going to be executed, or not executed, but uh, sacrificed as a burnt offering. Abraham believed he would rise from the dead. Isaac foreshadows the first coming of Jesus, as all shadows. But on the other hand, Luke uh, sees that, uh, that the second coming of Jesus, or Matthew sees this, second coming of Jesus as the son of David. Just as Solomon ruled over the house of Israel, so Jesus will rule over the kingdom of God. And as he was promised, the son would live forever. That's the son who's coming. But now what Luke says is, I'm very interested in this promises to Abraham because I'm a Gentile myself. And that's why I'm kaleidoscoping you. You're looking at the Jewish Messiah, son of David. I'm looking at the Gentile savior of the world, the son of Abraham. He's kaleidoscoping him. Same, same, just different. <laughs> that's a lovely expression. Now watch how, in, his, in their Gospels, watch how Luke kaleidoscopes Matthew. I don't know why these scholars haven't seen this, but it's so clear. Firstly, in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, and so on. Um, notice that everyone is mentioned twice. Now that's a good Jewish way of doing it, because it's a generation. Abraham, the father of Isaac, generation one. Isaac, the father of Jacob, generation two. And then Matthew talks about generations. So what does Luke do? He says, no, no, no. So-and-so was the son of Judah, was, uh, who was a son of Judah, right? Jesus' line, son of Judah, son of Jacob, um, son of whoever, son of um, Isaac, sorry, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, boom, all the way up to Adam. All he does is he says, I'm not going to quote anybody twice. I'm quoting him once. Because Matthew, you're writing a Jewish account of the virgin birth. So you put generations. I'm writing a Gentile account, so I don't. See what he does. He kaleidoscopes Matthew. Matthew starts from Abraham and goes down to Jesus. Luke starts from Jesus and goes back to Abraham. Bart Ehrman says in his book, Jesus Interrupted, we don't know why Luke put his genealogy at the end of his nativity narrative. Well, I do. You know why I did it? Because Matthew put his at the first, at the beginning. <laughs> Matthew, whatever you do, I'm doing the opposite. You start with your genealogy. I end with mine. Yours comes down from the top. Mine goes from the bottom up. And then Matthew, yours starts from Abraham. Mine goes up to Adam. Why? Because you, seeing only the Jewish heritage, which is fine in a Jewish context, but I'm seeing the whole heritage. Jesus came as the savior of the world. I'm taking this back to Adam. You see it? 
Okay, you see how clearly Luke is, well, to use an expression, which is the same as, this is the same as kaleidoscoping. If you don't want kaleidoscoping, as you'll know what this is. He is counterbalancing Matthew. He's not contradicting him. He's saying, I'm showing a different picture. You've got the picture of the Jewish Messiah. I'm showing the Savior of the world. And you can see how the differences go when you do that. Every scholar knows that when you read Matthew's account of the virgin birth, it's all about males. The only women mentioned there are really out of place. Tamar, Bathsheba, um, and so on, Ruth, Gentiles, adulterers, and what have you. Just to show that, that Jesus came to, you know, to save the uh, people from their sins, as it is in Matthew. But the real reason is because with Jews, only the males counted. So it goes right down the genealogy, down, down, down to Joseph, the father of Jesus. And then it's Joseph who gets the vision from Gabriel. It's Joseph who gets told to go to uh, Egypt. It's Joseph who's told to come back. Mary just tags along like a good Jewish woman would do. <laughs> but in Luke's gospel, he reverses that. In Luke's gospel, everything takes in the woman. It's Mary who sees the angel who says you're going to have a son. It's Mary's sister who gets a uh, cousin, Elizabeth, who gets a similar vision. And the angel appears to her and says, and you're also going to have a son. And the two of them talk, and the Magnificat of Mary is there, and the blessing of Elizabeth is there. And all the way, you read right through Luke's gospel, it's all about the woman. In fact, it's, it's so bad for, for people who are not feminists, especially males who are chauvinists. It's so bad that the only time a male gets a chance to speak in Luke, the angel shuts him up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it goes like this. The, the angel says to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, you're going to have a son, your wife, and so on, and he doubts it. And then the angel says, you're going to be unable to speak for a long time. So the women do all the speaking in Luke. What's Luke doing? He's saying, well done, Matthew, and I agree with you that the line, the male line, down to Joseph, the father of Jesus, putatively, is fine in your Jewish context. But in mine, I know in reality, most of the talking was done to the woman. You see the contrast again? It's counterbalancing him all the time. But the one thing that, that uh, Luke really enjoys doing in his gospel, I can tell you, if I ever see him in heaven, I'd say, I bet you did this with a grin on your face. <laughs> he loves it. This he loves more than anything else. He sees that Matthew is so determined to prove that Jesus is the promised son of David through the line of Solomon. Can't understand any other way because that's how the Jews saw it. God promised a son to David and he, your son, will be the one who prefigures the greater son of David to come. And when the Messiah comes in kingly glory, as the Jews always knew he would, they said Christ, the son of David, they knew Solomon is the son of David who represents the coming Messiah. So Matthew goes through the line of David to Solomon and down to Joseph. So you know what Luke does? <laughs> oh, he loves it. He goes back up and he goes from Joseph, he says, who was as supposed the father of Jesus. So he makes it clear I'm not giving Joseph's genealogy. That's the good Jewish way of doing it. That's the way Matthew does it. What I'm doing is I'm giving a different way. I'm giving the Gentile way. I'm giving the woman's way. It's Mary's genealogy. I'm talking about Mary all the time. That's Luke's attitude. This is Mary's genealogy. Joseph was only the a supposed father of Jesus. And he puts that in deliberately so you know he's not giving Joseph's genealogy. It's Mary's. That's why it's different. Where does Mary's genealogy go? goes through a whole lot of obscure names, past the deportation, right up to David. And which son does it go through? Nathan. Oh, Luke enjoyed that. <laughs> you know why? That contradicted everything the Jews ever expected about the Messiah. Because what he knew was that Jesus was physically, through the virgin birth, descended from Mary alone. And he knew Mary's line went to David through another son. Oh, he enjoys this. He sidesteps Solomon completely to go back to Isaac. And he says, that's where we are. Isaac is the one. Jesus, the savior of the world. Isaac foreshadowed his first coming. Jesus was born the first time. 
as a baby. So Isaac was born uniquely of parents who couldn't have children. Jesus will not come back as anybody's baby child the second time. So Jesus is not physically descended from Solomon. And Luke just relishes showing the, the, the line of Jesus going through Nathan all the way back to Abraham. He loves that. He really does. And that's what he's saying. In your theological terms, Matthew, and in Joseph being officially, according to Jewish law, the father of Jesus, yes, your line through Solomon fits. He's the Messiah, the son of David. But I'm showing that he's the Savior, the son of Abraham. And my genealogy sidesteps Solomon completely. It's incredible. See what he's doing? He's doing it all the time. That's why I say the evidence is overwhelming. That Luke's sitting with Matthew's gospel in front of him. And he, as he looks at him, he says, whatever you say, I'm going to counterbalance it. Um, watch this. Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers who records the unique birth of John the Baptist. Uh, the angel comes to Elizabeth and to Zechariah. You're going to have a son. And if you read the first three chapters of Luke, you will see that there's a tremendous amount of emphasis on the fact that John the Baptist is also born uniquely at the same time as Jesus. In fact, when Mary and Elizabeth meet each other, Elizabeth says, what is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Because when you came into my presence, the babe in my womb leapt for joy when you knew the one in yours. They were cousins. They knew each other. They were close. And not only that, but Luke says that when the angel appeared to Zechariah and Elizabeth, it was to present a special birth because both were advanced in years and, they were, and Elizabeth was barren. She'd never had children and she was too old to have children. Have you heard that before? Of course. Abraham and Isaac, Sarah, it's the same story. Abraham and Sarah were too old to have a child and Sarah was advanced in years. She'd never had children. What's the link? There's a clear link between the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Isaac. What is it? tell you what it is. It's simply this. Isaac foreshadowed the coming of Jesus, just a shadow, but because he's, he didn't have a virgin birth, but he had a special birth. He wasn't sacrificed, but a ram was sacrificed in his place. He didn't rise from the dead, but by coming back, Abraham got him back figuratively. He was a shadow of Jesus. John the Baptist is the same. He comes as the herald, the one who announces Jesus to Israel, the Messiah. And what he does is, John the Baptist is born in the same way, to show that the link between John the Baptist, who actually introduces the Messiah, and Isaac, who foreshadows the first coming of the Messiah, so that you can see that John the Baptist announces the son of Abraham, not the son of David. In Matthew, it's the son of David. In Luke, it's the son of Abraham. That's what he sees. John the Baptist comes in Isaac's line, not Solomon's. And that's what he sees. And the thing is here that he's the only gospel writer who records that story. And that's why he does it. To show the difference between his genealogy, his understanding of the virgin birth of Jesus and Matthew. But you can see again, he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows Matthew's gospel. And he's counterbalancing him. And then if you look into the book of Isaiah, I'm not sure the passage is in Isaiah, but it goes like this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, Matthew quotes that. And Luke says, very good, Matthew. You're quite right. He's the one, the Messiah of Israel, who's promised. But you know what Luke does in chapter 3? He quotes the whole text. He goes further. He says, Isaiah said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Every valley will be filled Every mountain will be laid low. The crooked will be made straight. The rough ways will be made smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of our God. What's he doing? He's saying, John the Baptist comes to announce the son of Abraham, who, the, the, Isaac, the, the, the fulfillment of Isaac who was promised to the whole world. And he takes the whole passage out of Isaiah to say, that's our Gentile hope. That's our Gentile savior. Your Jewish Messiah, our Gentile Savior. Same, same, just different. Same story, same purpose, different definition. And that's why he quotes that whole passage, to show that John the Baptist came to announce the coming of the son of Abraham. And even further there, 
um, you see what Mark does. Mark wrote his gospel first. And he says, um, John the Baptist appeared, baptized Jesus, and then Jesus takes over the story from there. Matthew takes the whole of Jesus' birth and records it in the virgin birth story. But he leaves John the Baptist. He follows Mark that only at the age of 30, when John comes preaching a repentance, baptism of repentance, then Matthew follows Mark. So Matthew's John the Baptist is up there at the age of 30. Only Jesus is covered in Matthew's um, infancy narrative. But Luke says, well, Matthew, in your Jewish context, that's fine. But in my Gentile context, I want John the Baptist. I want to pull him right in here to the birth of Jesus, that his birth was unique. An angel appeared to his parents. The two of them interacted. I know that. And I know why. Because he came as the son of Abraham, who comes for the whole world. He's not contradicting Matthew. He's just, as I said earlier, he's kaleidoscoping him. He's counterbalancing him. He's saying, your Messiah came in the line of David. My Savior of the world comes through the promise of Abraham, the Savior to the whole world world. I could even go on further, but I won't. I want to just show you something this morning that to me is just so encouraging. There are things in scripture most people have never seen before. (laughs) How many of you have heard anything like this before? Not one of you. (laughs) But just see how incredibly interacting those two births accounts are. Here are these big thick books. Like Brown says, you can't deal with them together. They're totally different stories. Here's Mashin. He says the same. Others say totally contradictory. There's no single source. There is. There's a very definite single source. Matthew's account of the virgin birth of Jesus is the single source. Luke takes that source and kaleidoscopes it. Simple as that. It just shows you how in an incredible literary structure, Luke kaleidoscopes Matthew. And what I love about it is, and I can tell you this, he could never have done that unless the facts were at his disposal. He wouldn't have dreamt that up. I've never heard anyone else dream something like this up. Luke did it because he had the facts. He'd studied them. He'd got all the evidence he could. And it was enough for him to be able to write a totally different count of the virgin birth, but nothing more different than heads and tails on a coin. Same coin, same, same, just different. Heads one side, tails the other. And that's Luke. Matthew, Jewish Savior, sorry, Jewish Messiah. My book, Gentile Savior. It's a wonderful story and it gives me so much confidence in the scripture. Just to close, I've seen since then, because once you see something once, you start seeing things like doing a Sudoku puddle. You know, you, you can't figure out where all these figures go. The number three goes there. Ah, well, if the three goes there, then the eight goes there, not a three, and so on. And you start spotting things. Now, I've spotted something else, but I can't talk about it today, but I'll just tell you. Luke counterbalances and kaleidoscopes Mark as well. Bart Ehrman taught me that. Um, And John does the same. He counterbalances Luke and kaleidoscopes him in one thing, and he does exactly the same to Mark in another. I found four different occasions in the Gospels, only in Luke and John, but where they are using this literary structure of same, same, just different. One thing, two hands together, split them up, different, totally different. And it's incredible how the Holy Spirit structured Scripture, because that structure I've never seen anywhere else. Nobody could have invented it. It's just that they had the facts at their disposal. And what Luke did was to look at Matthew and say, Matthew, you've given the blue. Actually, the full color is green. But you've only given the blue. I'm not going to give the green and contradict you. I'm going to give the yellow and counterbalance you. (laughs) You got the blue, I've got the yellow. Put them together, we've got a beautiful picture of the green, the whole story. I get so encouraged when I just see the depth of Scripture and how this book can sustain itself as true. And I want to encourage you this morning. This talk does nothing else for you to believe that God's word is true. And whatever challenges you hear to the word of God, believe me, there are answers. And my experience over the years has told me the answers are usually in the scripture itself as they hear this morning. Thank you. Thank you.